from the dark recesses of my unconscious mind into the glaring light of objective reality. You are listening to the Dark Mind Podcast. Friends and familiars, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Dark Mind Podcast, where we explore the boundless realm of dark literature and film. On today's show, we have an actor, writer, and director with a penchant for folk tales. He hails from the Netherlands and has brought his unique brand of terror in a Shudder original. He's joining me today to talk about his surreal work of folk horror, Moloch. So without further ado, join me as we delve into the dark insight of Nico Vandenbrink. Nico, welcome to the show. Thanks, Vince. Uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for joining me on this 10th day of August 2023. I came across your film Moloch while I was browsing around on Shutter, and besides the five skull review rating, I was struck by not only the title, but also the use of the infamous Canaanite god Moloch. So I checked the movie out and thoroughly enjoyed the psychological and supernatural intrigue. So I'm eager to get into the devil in the details and I'm excited to have you on the show. Yeah, me too. Excited to talk uh, about Olak and uh, film and uh, everything. Awesome. So the film is about a young woman named Bittrick who lives on the edge of a peat bog in the Netherlands. She lives with her mother, father, and daughter in her parents' home. Her family is seemingly cursed due to the history of Beatrix's grandmother being murdered, her young husband mysteriously dying, her mother developing some strange seizure-like disorder, and her father beginning to drink too much. And a mentally ill man referred to as the Bagman begins to dig massive holes in the bog because he hears voices that tell him to do so. He uncovers a body that turns out to be hundreds of years old, and that is when the mystery begins. So Beatrix's character is a very interesting mix of self-reliance and emotional resignation. What kind of direction did you give Sally Harmson with regard to the portrayal of Beatrix's demeanor? Uh, it's an interesting question. To me, yeah, Beatrix, she's very unapproachable, very reserved. That may come across as sort of her being self-reliant, but in my mind, it's a product of trauma, of sort of the intense uh, trauma. You mentioned her husband suddenly dying, her grandma being murdered when she was five. So it's kind of a necessary wall she has put around herself. And all these events caused her to kind of be brought back into the fold and under her mother's wings, which, you know, should be the safest place you could be. But it's far from any place that Beatrice wants to be, to be kind of a daughter again when she is herself a mother. So... Those are things that we discussed, that uh, Sally and I discussed, uh, to help her kind of um, shape her approach to who Beatrix is. Okay. And the thing that kind of brought this to my mind was, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, William Friedkin that just passed away, The Exorcist. Yes, yeah. Yeah. He used to, I guess for lack of a better word, almost provoke 
responses out of his actors. Do you ever, I mean, obviously probably not as intense as him. I think sometimes he actually resorted to violence, but do you ever uh, use any kind of emotional provocation to get things out of your actors? Uh, No, I don't. At least I don't believe that I do. I like to just talk about the characters and let the actors do their work themselves. And I'm a big believer in casting, spending lots of time doing that process right and finding the right actors to create the characters and let them bring their own personality into the characters. And I don't know, it's hard enough as it is to kind of make a movie (laughs) under normal movie making circumstances. So I don't feel like adding sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, Gotcha. Well, the character of the bag man is the catalyst for the story when he digs up the ancient body because, again, he heard a voice that told him to do so. Did you write his character with mental illness because people wouldn't bat an eye at him saying that he heard a voice telling him to dig? Or was it more about his vulnerability to being manipulated by a spirit? And can you expand on that? Yeah, it's a bit of both, really. I guess he is someone who kind of lives on the fringes of society outside of the public eye. So if he starts behaving strangely, no one would bat an eye. And on the other hand, you could see him as someone who is very sensitive and kind of mentally vulnerable. And in that state, his mind is wide open to the whispers in the bog. Uh, So he's kind of the ideal catalyst uh, for our story. Well, so once the body is found, a team of what I assume are forensic archaeologists, would that be accurate? Yeah, plain archaeologists. Or just regular archaeologists, okay. Show up to excavate the site. They call in an expert named Jonas, and it's at this point the dialogue becomes almost exclusively English. So what part of the story arc was the change in language meant to highlight? So Moloch is kind of a reverse folk horror in the sense that normally when you watch like a folk horror movie, you'll have an outside character coming into this sort of closed off community. And in Moloch, we have a protagonist who lives there and who's kind of part of this community. So we kind of needed an outsider coming in to yeah, basically explain and tell the audience story through him, through his eyes. So I guess when he comes in and the language shifts to English, that kind of marks maybe the audience coming in and the audience starting to research what is going on in this little town. So it's almost as if at first through the subtitles, it's almost like you're reading an old tome, like later on in the movie where his assistant is actually reading the legend, which we'll get to later, but it's just basically in its original form. Yeah. And then it's brought into the mainstream. Okay. Well, there is a scene in the movie at a hospital involving Beatrick and a young boy. And the young boy is terrifying. And you've already mentioned it earlier with regard to asking if you do anything to provoke certain emotions from your actors. You said, besides just having a discussion with them, you try to get it at the beginning in the actual casting process. So when it comes to using a young boy in the movie, how do you cast and direct a young actor in order to make them terrifying? I mean, as far as casting, how do you know he's the one and how do you know the best way to set up the shot to make a young boy, which is inherently innocent and non-threatening into something ominous? Mm, Yeah. I don't know. I guess you never really know until you're on set and you see if it works. But in the case of uh, uh, Brent, who was the the young actor who plays the boy in the elevator, I could see on the casting tapes, for example, that his eyes are kind of standing out. He has this very, very deep, dark brown eyes. And under the right circumstances, I guess with the right light, they turn almost black. So that gives his gaze this uh, sort of intensity. So immediately it felt interesting together with his long hair. And I don't know, he stood out actually from all the other 
very Dutch boys, I guess, that we saw. And another fun part of it was that Brent actually has an affinity for horror. He makes horror movies with his friends. And so I knew that he was going to be not necessarily easy to direct, but he was used to being in front of the camera. So that helped as well. Okay. And so did I understand correctly? You didn't even have to be in the room. This is from casting videos? Yeah. My assistant, Natalie, she did casting for some of the smaller parts mm -hmm. in a movie. And then we discussed based on videos who was going to be chosen for the roles. And like the medium big parts, I would then see in the room and the bigger parts of like the main cast, I cast myself. Awesome. And I was curious, you know, I'm always curious about the details of the filmmaking process. I'm trying to think if I can ask this without giving a spoiler, but basically in the hospital scene, there is, at first she's kind of looking at him from a distance and then there's a point at which that distance is closed in a little bit closer. Is that something that you planned out as far as a shot or is that purely editing? You mean she's sitting down in the hallway and she mm -hmm. looks through the glass? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually editing. It's also lenses. Mm -hmm. So we shifted to a longer lens, lens to uh, bring them in closer. Is that what you mean? Yeah, well, just like so the initial point is he's with his father, kind of not paying attention, just kind of sees Beatrix, you know, like, side glance or whatever she looks down and then she looks up and he's much closer so mm -hmm. i was curious to know whether that's the way you envisioned the shot he was going to be here then he was going to be here or was it just multiple shots of him and the editing is where that decision was made and happened i think there were a couple of steps in there that we wanted to Tell, and I wasn't sure if I was going to use all the steps, but I knew that at some point she was going to be interrupted by a nurse mm -hmm. who asks, can I do anything for you? And she says no. And then the nurse, she's on this uh, chair with wheels. She rolls out of the shot and then, bam, we see the kid yeah. standing uh, yeah. Yeah, behind the window. I knew that that was going to be like not necessarily a scare, but a shot that should have impact. And it makes Petrik jump mm -hmm. enough her to kind of want to leave the room made me want to leave the room <laughs> <laughs> when i saw that in the edit i didn't expect it to be as powerful as it was because i felt like it was really freaky how he kind of looks through the window and just mm. stands there it's really eerie yeah i was happy to see that yeah yeah that's what i was curious was that planned or just like wow once you did it you were like whoa we uh we created a monster there <laughs> yeah a little bit probably some of it was, uh, and luck yeah well so the character of moloch is a terrifying historical deity is there anything interesting you found when you were researching this deity that you wouldn't find doing say a standard wikipedia search it's been a while since i really dove very deeply into Moloch and his sort of the history there. So I'm not sure what is on Wikipedia and what isn't, but one thing that I found peculiar and interesting was that Moloch may have been kind of a fabrication for propaganda purposes. Really? By ancient Greek. Okay. Because they were at war with uh, Carthage. And I read at some point that the theory goes that you know, they came back from this war and they were telling stories about how these people are the most evil people on the world. And they even sacrificed their children for prosperity or to win this war. So it's all kind of propaganda, fog of war, maybe, that made this deity come to life. So they were trying to dehumanize the other side, basically, saying that they worshipped not only a deity that's evil in a sense, period, but probably the most evil when you think about the harming of children yeah yeah it doesn't get more evil than that right yeah. sacrifice children so yeah it would have been very effective if it was a kind of propaganda thing yeah oh interesting mm -hmm. okay well 
speaking of deities, legends, lore, and the like, the movie centers around the legend of FICA. And I'm sure in previous interviews, people have probably asked you the same question. So I hope you're not sick of answering it. But is this real folklore or is this something you created for the film? And if you can do it without creating any spoilers, could you tell us about any real life lore that you may have cribbed from? Mm -hmm. No, I actually don't mind you asking question. I think it's a fun question to answer. Part of it, we just made up to kind of fit the film because it had to be very specific what happens. And part of it is based on traditions and uh, folklore we have here in the Netherlands. So actually you have villages kind of reenacting the prosecution and um, execution of witches. Actually our prop maker, our practical effects guy, he comes from a village where they do that every year and everybody dresses up and they reenact the whole trial with a witch and then her being taken to the stake. And part of it is based... But not any particular one, just... So they reenact a particular story there. It's Mechtot Ten... Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a woman. And if I'm correct, I think she was the last woman to be trialed and burned as a witch in the Netherlands. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And let me see if I'm not giving away any spoilers. So the story of Moloch kind of began with this legend that we have, or it's kind of a folklore story, the legend of the Witte Wieve, the white ladies or the white women, something like that, you could translate it as. And it's what we call a certain type of fog. It's very dense, low-hanging fog you will see in the morning in the fields. And as a boy, I always biked. I lived in, in a little village. I biked to school and I was always biking amongst this sort of white women. So that kind of sparked my imagination. And we have bog bodies, actual bog bodies here that were dug up from the bog. And I was thinking, what if those are the same thing? What if the ladies in the fog are actually people who were sacrificed and dumped in water here? So that's a bit of real Dutch folklore that laid the foundation for Moloch. Okay. Interesting. So you called them bog bodies. Yeah. So, yeah. so you took artistic license to write the screenplay to put forth the theory, well, what if they were these executed witches, but do they know what these bodies are, what they're from? So they're different bodies, but the theory is that they were part of a ritual. They were usually strangled, like a very famous one is the girl from Ida, and she has this kind of woven cord around her neck. So the theory is that all of these people ended up in the bog through a ritual where they were sacrificed to some deity. So that part of it is all true. And then we took some creative license with the details. Wow, I thought you were going to say it was like some sort of some sort of environmental event that killed people. That's as scandalous as it being executed witches. I mean, these people were sacrificed in a ritual. Were these like witches or Satanists or <laughs> I mean Yeah, this was all pre Christianity. So these were heathen rituals. And usually I think it was an honorable thing to be sacrificed. And Oftentimes, the people that were kind of found in the bog, they had very nice clothes for the time and they had been fed well. So, yeah, I guess it was something that kind of bestowed honor on the family and on the person. Yeah. Okay, so that sounds very familiar with what the Vikings used to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that possibly what it was from? Oh, I don't know. It might have been part of the same culture, but there are lots of bog bodies that are also found in uh, Denmark, for example. So, Well, that was all and, through Scandinavia, wasn't it? The Vikings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yes. Well, speaking of the bog, 
I can see how the atmosphere of a peat bog is perfect fodder for a story because of the cold, dark atmosphere with a lot of decaying plant life. But was there anything else in particular that inspired you to use it as a setting for the film? Because I know you said you grew up in a village. Was it around a peat bog or? Uh, no, no, actually not. No, <laughs> no, there wasn't a lot of peat in the area where I grew up. But there was a lot of water, and um, water has always been something that I find very scary. It's everywhere when you step out of the door. It's like your boots sink into the mud. And um, I remember going fishing on a morning with a friend and staring into the water, and then these sort of white eyes stared back at me, like these big white eyes. And it turned out that it was a dead calf, actually that had been dumped in the water by a farmer who didn't want to pay the truck to take his dead cattle. So they mm -hmm. tied, like, I guess, bricks to his hind legs. And then it was kind of floating just under the surface, staring up at me. So that always sparks kind of the horror imagination. <laughs> and yeah, the box came in basically because of the bog bodies. And that is uh, something that I find very fascinating. Gotcha. Well... Where exactly was, I looked on IMDb, I think I must have looked in a few different articles, where exactly was Moloch shot and what kind of obstacles did you have to deal with when it came to weather, topography and the population? Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> lots of obstacles. <laughs> yeah, the Netherlands uh, it can be uh, awful in terms of weather. So we had like storms and we had uh, a snowstorm actually at some point overnight, everything had turned white and we had to sort of clean the snow out of the garden and that sort of stuff. It was shot, by the way, actually in the north of the Netherlands. You don't have a lot of peat left, like original peat. So in the north of the Netherlands, in Drenthe, it's called. This is also where most of the bog bodies have been found. You still have some peat fields, I guess, like a real swamps, original swamps. And one of the big problems, I guess, was on day two, we had found this really beautiful spot in one of the kind of marsh areas. And there was this kind of curvy path with high water on both sides. And we wanted to shoot most of our scenes on that path. But we had this forester, I guess. He was showing us spots where we could shoot. And he said, but there's one, but it's breeding season now. So if there is any chance of a rare bird breeding when you're shooting there, then you have to move. Then you have to just go somewhere else. No. I thought, well, okay, what are the chances that we have a rare bird breeding exactly where we want to shoot? Uh -huh. And then, of course, on the day that we were going to shoot, there was this gray lag goose. <laughs> that was really on our little pathway. So we had to move and just change everything, change the whole shoot around this goose. So <laughs> that was one of the unexpected obstacles. So the local wildlife sex life was really interfering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Oh. What about things like, um, I don't know, set lighting and all that kind of stuff? I mean, were you just getting stuck in muck and stuff like that? Yeah, it was a challenge, especially with lights, placing lights, and especially the distance that we have had to bridge from, like you have an entrance to a peat bog, for example, and from that point you can't really move any trucks in, so you have to move all the lights by hand, and if you're a mile away from the entrance, then all the lights have to be moved by hand a mile up and down. So that took a lot of time. And then it was, of course, difficult to place tracks uh, for dolly shots, that sort of stuff. There were lots of hurdles, obstacles. And I guess you had to make sure you had charged batteries. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's no, no electricity around. Yeah. Well, the ending... Holy shit, the ending. <laughs> I'm not going to spoil anything and cheat anybody out of the ending. Your sound design, the special effects, and the stunning reveal where your suspicions are either validated or completely overturned. Just chef's kiss. Perfect. Masterful. 
So I was curious to know, when it came to making the festival circuit, what kind of feedback did you get about the ending? And did you get any real-time visceral responses during the screenings? Like, were you just sitting there and people around you just like, holy shit? Because I, I got to tell you, that's basically what my fiance and I's response was. We scared the hell out of our dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what you like to hear as yeah. a horror filmmaker. Yeah, no, I love uh, attending uh, festival screenings because uh, all the audience, they are so different, but you can also read the energy in the room. But I guess one screening that stuck with me was at the uh, Brussels uh, International Film Festival, uh, Fantastic Film Festival. And over there, I don't know, have you been to the Brussels Fantastic Film Festival ever? No. They have their own traditions. Like when a character walks through a door and they leave the door open, they will say, shut the door, shut the door. And if there's a moon in the image, then they will howl at the moon collectively. <laughs> very, very vocal audience. And they are just sort of screaming throughout this whole movie. Yeah. And it's fun. But what I noticed was that by the time that we got to the ending at the third act, uh, people got really, really quiet. So that was a nice reward. It means that they are into what's happening and they don't have time to think about moons appearing and that sort of stuff yeah yeah at first they were kind of following a script but then they got so sucked in it was like oh my god just yeah like, what is happening yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah well uh did you get any like verbal feedback as far as talking to anybody after the screening i mean i know that's probably hard to get specific without creating a spoiler but did you get any feedback like, man, I didn't see that coming or I knew that was coming, but it's so brilliant how you did it. Yeah, it's difficult to go into that too deeply without. Well, let me ask you this. How many people saw it coming versus how many people were just completely taken by surprise? I think most people are taken by surprise. Mm -hmm. by the end. It's a lot to unpack, I think. Mm hmm. So some things you are kind of supposed to know that they're coming. And the last shot, I'm thinking that by that point, 50% will know what's up. Mm -hmm. But the last shot is not really about presenting a twist. It's more about validating um, it. Yeah, exactly. And giving it meaning. Mm. Like what are the consequences now that this has happened? And uh if people say like, yeah, I saw the last shot, I saw that totally coming, that's not really what that's intended to do. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> again, this is like, I'm almost asking for the impossible here. I don't know if you can answer this question without a spoiler, but I was listening to an old episode of Rogan's podcast and I can't remember the name of the director. I can see the, you know, scenes from the movie, but he was talking about a, I guess, a technique that at the time was just starting to be used uh, called volumetric capture. He had used that in his film. And I love nerding out when it comes to post-production and finding out how people do things. So are you able to talk about how, like, whether during production or post-production, you were able to produce the spirits? I don't know if that's vague enough. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, and you specifically want to talk about a specific moment with the spirits? Like just in, in, in the field, I guess. We don't have to say who they are, just they're spirits in the yeah. field. How do you produce those, those uh, visuals? Yeah, I'm a fan of doing it like on set just would always prefer to minimize the amount of work in post uh, okay and yeah i kind of like having a feeling that something is really there and it's kind of palpable you can, can you can see that it's it's not put in digitally or anything so we actually had a whole field outside of the house full of women and it was very cold and very late so it was a bit of an enterprise and the bushes there are, some of them are prickly. So it's <laughs> not too lovely to stand there, especially on bare feet, but they did it and they did it well. And I think the effect 
was kind of immediate when you were standing there. You saw this is a kind of an intense moment. Mm -hmm. And then we had actual fog on set. So we had fog machines and we were lucky with the wind this time that there wasn't a lot of wind. So the fog would sort of stick around. Mm -hmm. And then in post, we added some more fog and some of the women had short skirts and you could see their legs in sort of white tights. Mm -hmm. And that distracted me a little bit. So we gave them all long dresses and you never see any feet. For some reason, seeing a ghost's feet make them... Too real? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it makes it feel like you're looking at an actor in a suit. Yeah. So that was um, an unexpected effect, actually. And we took care of that in post. What about the, I guess, what would you refer to it as translucence? The kind of... Mm. Not all the way transparent, but... Because they are dressed in white and their hair, they have white wigs. They kind of reflect the light the same way as the fog does. Mm -hmm. So the fog makes it feel like they are translucent. They are sort of disappear into the fog oh. and there's no boundaries. But they're not actually transparent. Okay. So I imagine you're more of a fan of practical effects than any kind of digital stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, all the effects we did practically and then enhanced them or altered them in, uh, in visual effects. Okay. Yeah. So you co-wrote the script with, and I do not want to butcher his name. Can you tell me how you pronounce his name? Uh, Dan Bucker. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about him and what the process of your collaboration looked like? Uh, yeah. He's also a filmmaker. He's also a director. And he made a very cool movie called Quality Time, which is like this sort of super dark comedy. And I felt like there was a connection with how he thinks about movies and the way I think about movies. So I asked him to work on a film before and then he didn't really have time and then the idea of Moloch popped in my head and I brought it to him and this time he did have some time to, to spar and to think a bit uh, about the concept and so we started talking about that and together kind of made the concept for Moloch what was just a sort of very rough idea and in terms of our collaboration for Moloch the way we got funding in the Netherlands was for every movie that you make or nearly every movie that you make, you have to get funding from the government because there's not enough people to go see the movies here oh. to make money back. So you're always losing money on any movie. So there was this program back then for like first time filmmakers. And it was kind of a race where you have people dropping out of the race during the whole process and it takes a year and a half, you have to commission and they kind of evaluate where you are with your plans. And in the end of it, they make two movies. So they fund two movies and uh, we were lucky enough to be part of that. Yeah, it's been a wild collaboration. We've had a lot of iterations of Moloch and the story. And when we were shooting, actually, we were still doing major, major rewrites. So Sometimes I didn't even know what scene, when we were shooting a scene, I didn't know what scene came after or what scene came before because we still had a lot of things to uh, take care of in the script. Now, were y'all getting together and brainstorming and writing or were you just kind of doing your own work and then comparing notes or how does that work? Uh, yeah, we were talking a lot just in the room. Mm -hmm. I guess this was pre covid but by the time we had to deliver the script, the final script, it was March of 2020. So we didn't see each other for a while. Mm. And then we were doing more work when we were in the run-up to the shoot. That was a strange time. It's kind of, I don't know, vague in my head, but I guess we did a lot through Zoom mm. back then. Dan, right now, we like to just sit and talk on the phone. Mm. Like teenagers basically just sit and talk for a long time and move around, walk around and exchange ideas. Okay. Well, can I ask what was the budget for the film and why don't 
people watch movies. <laughs> yeah, in the Netherlands, um, it's just the audience isn't so big. We have about 17 million people. Actually, let me clarify. Were you saying movies, period, or horror movies? Well, the general movie-going audience isn't so big. Okay. So if you have 100,000 visitors in the Netherlands, then your movie gets an award because it's so awesome wow. that you have 100 visitors yeah. uh, you get a golden film but that won't make your money back and horror is unfortunately isn't very big in the netherlands yet so I'm hoping that one day we'll have a bigger horror tradition but right now we have like a handful of horror films and that's about it and just and more people was... need to see moloch <laughs> yeah yeah maybe <laughs> that'll that'll increase the uh the love for horror in the netherlands <laughs> yeah hopefully hopefully yeah, my plan is just continue making horror movies for as long as they'll let me. And at some point, maybe people will look differently on what, you know, what kind of stories we're, we can tell with horror, with a genre in the Netherlands. And so what was the second part of your question? Well, if I can ask, what was the budget for Muller? So it was 1.8 million euros. I think that's about $2 million. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, great movie. Well worth the money. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is going to be another one of my uncultured moments. Moloch won the Melisse d'Argent. <laughs> Help me out. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Melies d'Argent. Melies d'Argent Award at Brussels International Fantastic Film Festival. Can you uh, tell us about that? Yeah, I was actually very, very surprised that it won that award because there were so many really great films in that competition. I didn't think that Moloch actually stood a chance, but apparently they saw something in it that made it stand out somehow. But yeah, it's a really cool prize because the winners of the Méliès d'Argent there's a number of film festivals in Europe that kind of participate in this competition and all the winners of the Méliès d'Argent, like the Silver Méliès, they go on to compete in CGS for the Méliès d'Or and it's a very prestigious prize, at least amongst genre films in Europe. Mm -hmm. That was awesome. Nice. And a, another huge accomplishment, the soundtrack of the film won a golden calf for best original score at the 42nd Netherlands Film Festival. And this film was scored by, I'm just going to throw caution to the wind and say, Ella van der Voude. Yeah, nearly. Uh, Ella van der Voude. God damn. Okay. Ella van der Voude. Is that correct? Ella van der Voude. Yes. Okay. And she holds the distinction for being the first female composer to win this award. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? That's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So making the soundtrack for Moloch was kind of a struggle. For some reason, it was the hardest part about the post-production process, I would say. And that's not because of Ella, because Ella came in quite late. We had other composers who also worked on the film, but then for a variety of reasons had to drop out. And Ella came in very, very last minute. And I was super happy that she could do it, actually, because I had worked with Ella on basically all of my films. Mm. And I was very sad that I couldn't work with her on this one because she I was otherwise engaged. But luckily for us, uh, she could uh, do it in the end. But she didn't have a lot of time to do it. So we kind of had to wing it and go with her gut on what the film needed. And yeah, it resulted in this amazing score. I'm really happy with the way the score came out. And then to be rewarded at the Netherlands Film Festival like that, that was a special moment for sure. And I'm very happy for Ella. It's uh, insane that no other female composer has ever won that award, but uh, it's a good step that uh, Ella has now. Nice. So she came in towards the end and uh, just had to go with her gut. Pure intuition created something amazing. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, so you mentioned that any film has to have a government grant. So is that 
the production company NL Film? Is that Netherlands Film? Or is that something separate, like a third party that you get funding from? Yeah, so NL Film is the producer, and um, that's actually confusing now. It's the NL Film Fund. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they are completely different organizations. And the NL Film Fund is basically the government. So it's uh, taxpayers who are investing in art and in our film industry, basically. All right. Well, you've had a lot of traction with your short film, The Burden. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the awards that it's won? Yeah. So The Burden I made in 2019, and it's about this girl who visits her boyfriend's family house, I guess, or family home, meets his family. And during that visit, some uh, skeletons come out of the closet. <laughs> Reveal some dark uh, family secrets to do also with a crazy neighbor girl. And yeah, I made that movie. So what you may need to know is that I made another film called Sweet Tooth in 2017. That was actually kind of the first horror film I did. Mm -hmm. So The Burden got selected to a number of really, really cool festivals. It was at Fantasia, for example, and it won, I think, award for best director of a short film or international short film. And yeah, it won awards, I think, in uh, the San Sebastian Horror Film Festival and uh, Molines de Rey in uh, Spain and in France. So uh, I guess people liked it, at least in the festival circuit. Yeah. Mm hmm. What do you think it was about it that drew so many people's admiration? I'm not sure. I think it's an entertaining story and it's kind of, yeah, I don't know. It's, I, can, I cannot say too much about it without giving away the twist. Oh, okay. Uh, we experimented with the camera, for example. The scenes are like in one shot and then we kind of interrupt that by cutting towards the end. We basically had fun with the format and the characters and kind of wanted to see like what happens if you do this what happens if you touch this button this button <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess that showed like sort of the excitement of making a movie and just finding out what you can do with the medium okay yeah very outside the box very experimental well so both the burden and sweet tooth which you mentioned earlier those were picked up by big production companies aside from the government, like some third-party companies? Yeah, in this case, they were picked up by Hollywood Studios. So, okay. Yeah. The system in Hollywood works completely different from the way it works in the Netherlands. In Hollywood, yeah, you make a movie, you have to earn your money back. <laughs> then you have a huge audience because everyone all over the world can see your movie. So they will put a lot of money towards production but the gains are way greater mm. once you release the movie. So Hadjuk was optioned by New Line, and um, New Line made The Conjuring, for example, yeah. and It, Annabelle. They released Evil Dead Rise now. So they have this long horror tradition. They started actually with Nightmare on Elm Street. Mm -hmm. So it was really cool for the film to be picked by these people and for them to start turning it into a feature. Nice. Now, are the strikes going to affect that? Yeah, everything is on hold now, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, so at the moment, everything is on pause. I'm, of course, still in my mind developing, and there's no director strike, so technically I can still communicate with the studio mm -hmm. surrounding the movie, but we cannot write, we cannot develop. So uh, we have to kind of sit tight and wait until that is all resolved. Yeah. Yeah. Well, until that's resolved and until they are created into feature films, what would be the best source for people to watch your short films? Those two in particular, but I think you have like four or five others at least that I saw in your uh, filmography. Yeah, unfortunately, my short films aren't widely available, especially 
the bird and, and sweet tooth because they are options and uh, probably until the feature is made and released, mm. these won't be shown online. Okay. And I made a short that is available in the Netherlands, but it's not available outside the Netherlands. So <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> only Moloch you can see on Shutter, like you mentioned, and on Amazon. Yeah. All right. Well, we will wait patiently. Moloch will tide us over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Well, let's see. You studied film at the University of Amsterdam and fiction directing at the Netherlands Film Academy. What is an aspect of filmmaking that you feel cannot be taught? It can only be learned by making a film. And was there anything in particular that you learned from the production of Moloch? Yeah, I think so. I would say one thing I learned, especially on the production of Moloch, is uh, that there is no such thing as total control. There will always be an element of <laughs> of chaos to filmmaking. <laughs> And it kind of takes a while, at least for me, it did to get comfortable with this kind of wild card nature of creating a story with a whole bunch of people in circumstances that you really can't control. So I don't know if you can harness that chaos and you can sort of relax into it, then I think, A, you'll have a lot more fun making a movie and I think the movie will be better in the end. Yeah, I've been told by the directors that I've interviewed that the best directors are problem solvers. So uh, I guess the first part of solving a problem is having to accept the fact that you can't control everything. Problems will come. So you've got to adapt and overcome. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If you can manage for that not to take up too much bandwidth and you can still sort of have fun making your movie and, and seeing what's there, what is created, then, yeah, I think that's the nicest way to do the job. Well, maybe this didn't happen, but what would be an example of a budgetary constraint that you had to overcome? Yeah, we had lots of budgetary constraints. One of the budgetary constraints was that I would have loved to build a house in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was no way that that was going to happen. So we had to shoot on location. We had to find a house that worked on the outside as well, on the inside. And it's surprising how often that is not the case when you're kind of looking for the right house that you find something that's on the outside. It's wonderful and the setting is perfect and everything works. And then you go inside and nothing works and it's terrible and you can't use it or it will be the other way around where the inside is awesome and very charming and it has everything. And then the outside is terrible because it's next to a highway or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky to find the house that we did. And uh, we were also very lucky with the people who were living there because they allowed us to kind of remodel the house and uh, oh wow, yeah, put up wood against the walls, for example, the wooden uh, slats. And um, we did a lot to the house and then they were very, um, generous in letting us just go berserk on their <laughs> living space so that well now was that their primary residence or is that like a vacation home or something no yeah it was their primary residence yeah yeah oh wow yeah. i think they went to stay in a hotel we were shooting there for three weeks i believe but that was one of the advantages of shooting in the north of the netherlands because i live in amsterdam and where I live, people are sick and tired of people making movies mm. and they won't let you shoot anywhere. They'll complain. And in the north of the Netherlands, people don't really see a movie set ever. Mm. And so they're still very excited. Mm. So that helped. That helped a lot. So was that an actual contained area? Like there's this house and then it's you know, like on the outskirts of, I guess you'd refer to it as a village, like where the parade takes place, where the bar is, all that? Yeah. So the world of Moloch is kind of an um, um, accumulation of different parts, different villages. Okay. But the house itself, it was quite isolated. And the path you see 
it's actually a bike path. So officially you can not really get there by car. Mm. That's how remote it was. And it's quite rare in the Netherlands to have a house that is that remote. Mm. And I guess it wasn't as remote as we make it look like in the movie because it wasn't near a peat bog. It was near some sort of meadow, but there was also a big road on the back of the house, which you don't see. So kind of built our own little world there. Yeah. Well, as far as building your own world, uh, creating an effective setting, all those elements that kind of condition you for the tenor of the story, what emotion do you think film can convey more effectively than any other art form? Tricky question. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Damn me. <laughs> it's a good question. I'm not sure. I think, like you mentioned, I studied film at the university, so I had a lot of kind of film theory. Mm -hmm. And most of it, it's a lot of blah, blah, but there are some interesting things. And one of the things that stuck is the term of effect mm -hmm. with an A. And that is when you look at someone's face, you kind of mirror their emotional state and that is very very immediate so if i'm crying now you will start feeling sad inside mm -hmm. and i guess that's something that film has that no other medium will have that directly when it comes to fear or happiness that sort of stuff i think you can feel the same emotions when reading a book for example or listening to mm -hmm. a podcast yeah but the immediacy of it, that's very different about film. And the aesthetics of a shot, the mood that it can bring, that's things that kind of work on the subconscious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear what you're saying about affect. Like, I think film can probably convey the nonverbal better than a verbal description of nonverbal, if that makes sense. Like, if you're writing that somebody looked intoxicated with glassy eyes and like their face was drawn or something like that. I feel like you can visually see that without being prompted at all, like completely out of context. Like you just see somebody walk into a frame. You don't know what's going on. You can look at mm -hmm. him and be like, oh man, that guy looks drunk, <laughs> you know? Whereas if you're reading it, you have to have all this context and a description of the face. Exactly. Yeah. A picture says more than a thousand words, mm -hmm. as they say. Yeah. Well, how old were you when you made your first short film? And in what ways did the time period in which it was made influence the film's content? I actually don't know. I think I was like a early teenager, like probably 12 when I made my first little thingy. And I don't know what it was about but i don't know the films that i made in my teenage years were things that got me excited like i had bought swords in spain for example so we made a film about a journalist who time travels to the roman age and he encounters this emperor and uh he gets into a sword fight that sort of stuff just sort of kids boy stuff okay so i don't know it wasn't too deep what I made, but it was just about the fun of filmmaking, fun of storytelling and sort of letting your imagination run wild. Mm. How old are you? If you don't mind me asking. I don't, I'm 37 now. 37. Yeah. Okay. So pretty close. The thing that prompted that question is I grew up in the nineties. So I'm thinking if I was a filmmaker and I started making short films when I was a teenager, they would probably be so angsty, you know, <laughs> just like, it's like this emo, like you know, overly emotional, dark stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a good way to kind of show and bring to life what's, inside and i didn't know when i started making movies that that was something that you could do for a living so you kind of do what you do in the purest form mm -hmm. right and i guess for me it was about having fun yeah more sort of the excitement and adventure of it all mm. yeah. nice 
Well, I'm sure you have plenty of directorial influences, but do you have any screenwriting influences? Yeah, sure. Like the screenwriters that have the biggest influence on me are the people I work with kind of daily basis. So Dan Bakker, who I wrote Moloch with, I still work with him a lot on different projects. And he has had a huge influence on my writing, I would say. But also working, for example, in the United States with the writers over there, like on Sweet Tooth, Stephen Herman, he is writing the script and he's just really talented guy and a lot of fun to work with. And he's just really good like in sort of creating high concept ideas and then making them shine. Mm -hmm. So I'm learning a lot from all these people. They are my biggest influences for sure. Nice. Well, <laughs> you know, I was thinking about this. It almost sounds like kind of a, a question you would go for a job interview, <laughs> but I'm curious, <laughs> what would you say is your greatest strength and weakness as a director? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Where do you see yourself in five years? <laughs> yeah. The greatest weakness is that I'm a perfectionist. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think... I've been very lucky, I guess, as a director to have an eye for talent. Mm. So I think I can spot quite well where someone's strengths lie. And if someone is really good and always try to find people who are way better at what they do than me. So I can kind of play catch up. And it's like you're running 100 meter sprints. You'll run the sprint faster if there's someone next to you who is faster than you. Uh. And so I've been fortunate to work with a lot of people who are very good at what they do and has had a huge impact on the quality of the movies that we've made together. So I would say that's a strength, weakness, lots of weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to want things a certain way and uh, I like them the way that I want them. And if they don't happen in that way, then... It takes me out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way that I want things or the way that I see things is not always the best way to do it. Mm. And I think I have a lot to learn there also. Like we were talking about before, right? Kind of relaxing and sort of embracing chaos or embracing coincidence, things that go a different way. That would be a field where I have things to learn. Sure. For sure. Okay. Well, do you feel that it's more advantageous for the production and success of a film for you personally? I'm not talking about other directors, just you personally to have also had a hand in or completely written the script as well as directing the film. Yeah, I think it's very different when you write a script that you're also directing, then you know the world intimately. Mm -hmm. And then I think you can direct maybe more on an intuitive basis. You'll know the answer to a lot of questions. And directing is also about making hundreds of decisions a day, mm. each day. So it helps if you have been in this world for a long time. You kind of know, know things uh, by heart. But if you haven't written a script, then you're kind of looking from the outside in, which... It might be a bigger hurdle to get into the world, but on the other hand, it also has its advantage that you're kind of more in the position of the audience. When you read it for the first time, you have a reaction, an emotional reaction, for example, that is more fresh and more honest, maybe as well. When you're too deep into it, then sometimes that can also distort your perception of, is this scene right here or does this work the way I think it works? Mm. So they both have their good points and their bad points. Okay. Well, besides staying within the bounds of the law, <laughs> do you think there should be a limit to what can be portrayed in a movie? Ooh. Just to give you context, the thing that brought this question up was me and one of my guests were talking about that movie Cannibal Holocaust, which obviously was unethically made, but aside from that, other movies that are just really extreme with taboo subject matter? Poof, that's a difficult question. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think with 
films, it's healthy to look for the boundaries, where the boundaries are. I don't know if you should censor things. Like Besides sticking to the bounds of the law, I guess you can do just about anything. But it's up to you as a filmmaker what you feel is ethically responsible. Okay. Yeah. Because did you have a moment with Cannibal Holocaust, for example, where you were like, this is not okay? And uh, Well, if what? the movie had been entirely fake, then I probably wouldn't have had a problem with it. But there was the actual killing of animals and yeah. the unethical, as far as I know, it was a 14-year-old girl in a simulated sex scene. So mm. obviously yeah. that just right off the bat makes it unethical and no, but you know, I've seen a Serbian film. Are you aware of that film? I've heard about it. Yeah. I haven't seen it. His intention from what I understand was not so much because the depravity was necessary is he was actively trying to be as depraved as possible to make a point I think it had something to do with film in Serbia at the time. It made a lot of people like really mad, but it goes far <laughs> like the uncensored version. You know, it's all nothing's illegal per se, but there's a child actor in there that's involved with a notorious movie that maybe later in life wouldn't want to have that stigma attached to him. I don't know. So, yeah, well, I think when it comes to, children in films you have to be extra extra careful mm -hmm. and you have a moral responsibility to take care of everyone involved in making the film mm -hmm. especially your actors yeah it's a difficult question because it's the same with art right can you do anything if you make art to make a point mm -hmm. yeah technically as long as you're within the bounds of the law but then there's the moral aspect mm -hmm. and i think it's every artist's responsibility to be conscious about what they do and how that affects the people that are involved in either making a movie or seeing a movie. Mm. Well, piggybacking off of your statement earlier when you were referring to being a director and having to make hundreds of decisions a day, when you start getting exhausted from being on set for hours on end and you can't shut things down for the day, there's something you've got to get finished because you, you know, you only have like, I guess an example would be maybe that house. You only had a certain amount of time and you're like, well, we got to be out of the house tomorrow. So we got to get this done. How do you extract creativity from an exhausted mind? <laughs> huh. Yeah. Well, like you said, it helps that you only have one shot at it. Mm especially when making this sort of semi-low-budget film like Moloch, we didn't have the luxury to say, okay, we'll move this to a different day because a different day was always too full. We always had too much planned in one day and we were never going to make that day from the start. So there was no room to move anything. So you have to, have to, have to get it on film that day. Mm -hmm. I guess for a director, because you're so intimately involved, your life is so sort of interwoven with what you're doing that there is this adrenaline and you can just keep going and going and going and going. But it's harder for cast, for example, who, you know, they have to wait a lot of the time. They have to be in makeup, get dressed, and then they have to wait and wait for the shot to be set up. They come in, they do their thing a couple of times and then they have to wait a lot again. So that takes its toll, uh, production assistance as well. Uh, and as a director, you're just always on. So that helps. And then you come home at night, you fall asleep immediately. <laughs> when you wake up, you're on again. Mm -hmm. And a lot of crew members, actually, they move from set to set to set. For directors, it's usually one period of a couple of weeks. And yeah, you can plow through that and then afterwards you sleep for a week. <laughs> but a lot of people, they do this for a living on a daily basis. So uh -huh. that's tougher, I guess. Okay. So it sounds like the way you get creativity from an exhausted mind is 
pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It you can to a certain extent force creativity. Mm-hmm. I really think so. You don't have to wait for the right mood or the right inspiration. If you have to do it, then if you force yourself, then oftentimes it just it comes out when you need it. Well, is there a resource that's available to filmmakers or aspiring filmmakers that the average person may not know about that you wouldn't mind revealing? I think this is a different way of answering the question. But to me, when it comes to finding inspiration, for example, I often read like 19th century Gothic horror stories, for example. Mm -hmm. And there are so many awesome, awesome, beautiful stories that have been written that no one does anything with. And these are, what is it? Common property? Oh, uh, um, common. No? Um, in the public domain. They're in the public. Exactly. Yeah. They are yes. Public. Yes. So you can use these stories to make films or to learn how to tell your own story. So for me, that's a huge resource as well finding inspiration. Interesting. Yeah. No, that's solid. <laughs> Listeners at home, write that down. <laughs> so with regard to the writer and actor strikes going on in Hollywood, strikes have happened in the past, but been resolved. Do you think that with the advent of streaming services and AI, that the result of these current strikes may be a lot different? Personally, I don't think so. There are a lot of factors, of course, at play from what I'm understanding, because streamers have a lot of content now. They are not as dependent on creating new content immediately. So they have potentially longer time to kind of be okay without writers. But I do believe that the studios and streamers will always need writers and good writers to create their product. Mm. Otherwise, they are nowhere. And in terms of AI, I haven't seen AI do anything that feels right now inspired or truly original. It sticks to mimicking what has been done before. So I'm wondering if AI can ever create something that is original the way a writer actually can. But I definitely think it will change kind of the landscape and the way people work. Mm. What do you think about the proposal as far as extras are concerned to pay them for a day of work, scan their, their body, so to speak, and have them sign over the image of their body in perpetuity so that they can use AI programs to use them as extras and backgrounds? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I think it's a very good thing that the Actors Guild is doing something about that yeah. because... Lots of people are in a very vulnerable positions. And if you offer them a couple of hundred bucks for a day's work and then kind of continue to use their image without them earning anything on it, it may feel at the moment like, hey, I have earned a couple of hundred bucks for a day's work. But then in the end, a lot of people will suffer a loss of income mm-hmm. that way. And I think that they really, really have to prevent. Yeah. Well, I see you have some acting credits as well. Are there any other aspects of filmmaking that you've been involved in? And what is kind of the chronology of it all? (laughs) Yeah, I've started out actually just wanting to be on a set, on a movie set. To me, it was kind of magical, this idea that you could be any profession within film and just make movies for a living. So I started out as an extra, basically, on sets. And I was on a lot of different sets and saw how it all worked and functioned. And then I got some small parts as well. And I like acting. I did some improv acting, that sort of stuff. And then I was also a production assistant, a prop manager, stunts coordinator. <laughs> Just be on a set and kind of experience that. And yeah, that was very exciting. Now, <laughs> now being on a set feels very natural, but it may have brought me some appreciation for all the people who walk around on the set. Yeah. 
Well, what is the life of Nico Vandenbrink like outside of filmmaking? <laughs> well, Formula One racing? <laughs> well, no, I'm not into Formula One racing. No, even though the Max Verstappen is, uh, of course, a Dutch hero. Uh. No, outside of filmmaking, that's kind of what happens when you turn your hobby into your work. It's that kind of crosses over. And when I'm not writing on a film or thinking about concepts, I'm watching movies or going to the cinema. I like reading a lot, cooking. But I think 90% of my life revolves in some way or another around movies, film, and uh, imagination. Live your passion. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> exactly. I can recommend it. Well, Nico, it has been a pleasure talking with you. Likewise, Vince. It's been fun. Great talking to you. Absolutely. Well, as we bring the show to a close, is there anything you'd like to plug or let your viewers know about? No, I hope people will find their way to Moloch and I hope we haven't given away too many spoilers and that it uh, will be a fun experience to watch the film and always eager to hear what people think. So you can reach out to me through Twitter for as long as I'm on there, I guess, or a video if you want to share your thoughts. All right. Well, listeners at home, all links are in the description. And Nico, thank you again for joining me. Thank you, Vince. And thank you to everyone that tuned in. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe to the podcast newsletter by clicking the link in the description. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday, where I will be joined by an author that has written a novella set in a dark, watery hellscape. So until then, stay healthy, stay sane, and as always, thank you for listening. See you next time. <laughs>